And um, I want you to know that every morning we get together in the prayer room and we pray before we get in here. And a word that the Lord gave us today was love. He loves you. And you know, I love you too. So we'd like you to stand up with us if you're able and join in to worship this morning. And those of you that are watching on Facebook, we love you too. <laughs> amen and amen. Hey, I'm just curious, how, how many of you have picked up one of these? The communion book? I'm telling you, this has been so far such an incredible, enjoyable journey. You know, not on, okay, not like the four years we did the negativity fast. <laughs> that was a journey, and it was a good journey. But, oh, this is an incredible journey. Um, every day, you know, having communion and just reconnecting with what Jesus did for us for 40 days coming into Easter. So join us if you haven't yet. I try to do these in the morning. If I don't, I get them, you know, on the, online <laughs> before the end of the day. But, God, we just thank you. Oh, there, there's power in the blood, unlike anything else in the universe, anything else on this earth, the blood of Jesus. And God, your body broken for us. I pray even now at home or here, anyone, God, that is sick, Lord, that you would touch them as they enter into your presence and as your presence enters into them as we worship you and give you praise. I thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people. So we praise you with all that is in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our song
day and night before your throne. Lord, we are the ones who carry the incense, the burning fragrance of love for our bridegroom king. Lord, you are so worthy. You're so worthy, Lord. Make us like Mary of Bethany, Lord, that we would find you worthy of breaking open our alabaster jar just to pour at your feet, Lord. Let it not be a waste to us. Let it not be seen as a waste to sit and worship you, to cry out, holy, 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 holy is the Lord, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy is the Lord, holy are you. Oh, let us cry out day and night. It's not a waste, God. It's not a waste to love you. It's not a waste to worship you. It's not a waste to adore you. It's not a waste to tell you how beautiful you are. 
us from your love no sin no shame no guilt no accusation no power nor angel nothing nothing separates us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus we thank you that your blood seals us in that covenant of love we honor you Jesus we stand in awe of you yeah we love you we just bless you God We are moving into declarations, um, you know, praying before coming up here. Um, I know for myself and my family, we've been going through a very hard season. And I know there's a lot of people in this room that have been going through hard seasons too. Um, and talking with friends and family, it's been hard for a lot of people um, across the world. Like there's something spiritual going on where it's pushing people in ways that we're not used to, things that are difficult. And through this process, God was reminding me, um, there was a few times where it's like, I felt like I couldn't do anything. He's like, you need to worship, just go worship. 
And our declarations, what they've been is about how our words have power. Our tongue has the power of life and death. And when we turn this power into worship, it puts our problems into their rightful place. So let's say these together. My words have power to build people up and encourage them. My words set the course for my life because when I speak God's truth, I become who he made me to be. I can ask the Holy Spirit to guard my mouth and give me the words of wisdom so that I may comfort the weary. There is life in my words. Amen. Amen. Woo. You guys can sit down. I also get to pray over the offering. Um, you can give online through the app, uh, the basket back there. I'm very staticky right now. I'm trying to hold it lightly too. Um, so Lord, we just, we thank you that you are a God that provides, um, that you see us where we are and that you want to give your children good gifts. And I pray that we as a people would position ourselves to be able to receive what you have for us. And Lord, in turn, be able to give back to you. Lord, and to see how this multiplication can work, Lord. That you give freely and we can freely give back to you and to those around us. And so we ask that you would bless, Lord, financially this body. And that you would continue to do these amazing things that we've already seen happen. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Our next Encounter Healing Rooms is Friday, March 1st at 6.30 p.m. We are hungry for more miracles, signs, and wonders and expecting great things for whoever comes. Step out in faith and encounter God at our next Healing Rooms. Attention, chili lovers. Our chili cook-off is happening Saturday, March 9th at 6 p.m. Everyone is welcome to this fun, tasty event for games, prizes, and lots of chili. Chili makers, put your best recipe to the test and let us vote for our favorite. If you'd like to enter your chili, please sign up by March 3rd and watch for further details. On Sunday, March 10th, for our 10 a.m. service, we are excited to have Charity Bowman Webb back at Inver Hills Church. Charity is from the Scottish Highlands and works around the world releasing God's spirit in creative and pioneering ways. Her passion is to help Christians deepen their relationship with God by exploring their spiritual gifts and God-given creativity. Invite your friends for this special opportunity.
just want to say this. If, if you weren't in those pictures and you didn't have a good time with the body of Christ last year, come on, man. I mean, there were so many opportunities. It's like, I'm, I'm ready to go take a nap now. You know, I, I sat down to do my annual report, which, by the way, is like one of my least favorite things to do. But <clears throat> I was trying to think about last year, and it was like, bye, kids. It was like, <laughs> it's over. And I was like, what happened last year? I mean, it was like there was just activities all of the time. But if you notice, it wasn't just our people in those pictures. It's amazing how many people got touched by God last year through this body loving on people. And, you know, the, the, even the, when Deb added, uh, Deb Nass added the 4-3, part of me was just like, you know, it's a great idea, but we're busy. <laughs> but I need you to know that Thursday night, I mean, a couple things happened. You know, and it just, it, this is the thing. God has called this church into a season of divine encounter. I mean, it's just who we are to be. And everything we do, we need to approach with that mentality that this is a divine encounter from God. And uh, I had, yeah, just to let you know, uh, you know, hard aim electronics, I had actually worn out and busted a otter box on my phone. And I'm like, oh, I got to get a different cover or that phone's going to be gone. And, and so uh, I just marketplaced and somebody over here in the trailer park on the, on the far south edge of Ember Grove uh, had a, a couple, you know, knockoff boxes. And I was like, I'll, I'll run over there. And twice between getting ready for Thursday night and working on the message and going to go over there, the Holy Spirit just, have you ever had that conviction from the Holy Spirit? Like it's real heavy. You've got to pray, but he won't tell you what it is. It's like, come on, God, just tell me what. So I'm in here praying, and, and just, so I run over there to get the otter box. Turns out to be a lady who, she, she grew up as a girl in this church. And some of the trauma that she experienced years ago was here. And she's done, had some ministry here, so did her husband. But that's who had the cases for the phone that I was going to buy. And the interesting thing was, just before I went over there, it was like, on Marketplace, is this Pastor Bart? <laughs> I was like, yes, it is. So I go over there and I meet him, and, and, and it's funny because she's like, you know, I didn't, I'd never really done this before, and so I called my mom to say, do you think it's safe to have them come to our house? And then she said, well, go look at who they are on Facebook, silly. See who it is. She goes, well, it's Pastor Bart. She's like, well, of course it is. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I, I get that case, and, and I'm, I'm coming back, and the Holy Spirit just kind of nudges me, and he's like, you missed it. It's like, what? So I pulled over, and it's like, hey, by the way, tonight we have this 4-3. If you know anybody in your neighborhood, and, and they came, and they're like, hey, next time you do it, give us a heads up a week in advance because we, we know at least 10 neighbors who could use this. I was like, whoa. And then as I'm carrying the grocery bags out to the car, and by the way, I'm calling you out, Anthony, wherever you are because you're not in one of these seats. But um, I, I put a bag in a trunk. And I turned around, and one, here's this guy carrying a bag of groceries. He looks at me in the parking lot, and he drops his bag of groceries. And he looks at me, and he goes, Pastor Bart? <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> but I, could, I recognized his voice. You know, I led, led him to Christ when he was like, I don't know, four years old here. He used to sit right up in front. I remember baptizing him in water, and it's all these years later, and he's like, <gasps> I was just feeling convicted because, you know, before Grandma died, she said, I need to come back to church and, and make sure I, and I didn't know you were here. And, oh, I'll be there at church, Pastor. And it was like, Anthony? And it was like, God just, you know what? Every time we have an event, it's a God encounter. It is. And, and you are containers of the Holy Spirit, which they need. And you don't know. I mean, man, just yesterday I'm sitting in a leadership training with somebody, praying with them, ministering to them, and halfway through the day he looks at me and goes, do you know a Michael Just? <laughs> Some mustache, glasses. I'm like, I think I do. I think he's in my church. He's like, oh man, about 15 years ago when I was, he ministered in my life. I was just like, whoa. And we just reconnected. And it's like, God has God appointments for you every day. And if you look at how busy that was, it was one God appointment after another. And that's the adventure God wants you to go on. Speaking of which, I, I, we've had a, 
Where is, is Kimber Jean still in the house? I think she's gone. I, I don't think we have another conference or training on Saturday. I think there's finally a Saturday where we don't have a training. And, and, but I got this in the mail. And it's like, join us February 27th for a faith and family ticket package presented. Anyway, if any of you want to go to a wild game, let me know. Nobody's jumping up and down. I'm like, we don't always have to do ministry together as a family. Having fun together is, it's okay. It's all right. And I'd like to do that. So let me know. So speaking of fun, immediately after church, we have an annual business meeting. Yay! Anyway, so there are words of knowledge and there will be prayer ministry, but it'll be in the prayer room to the side. So we'll invite you up, but if, if you want ministry, you'll go there. The prayer ministers will go in there, be with you. Um, and the rest, uh, if you want to come to the Animal Business Meeting Lab, you go out the center doors as quickly as possible, sign up on the roster, and come back in for the meeting. And um, we will make that as quick and painless as we can. Um, Teresa, if you're watching from Carolina, great job on the compilation video. Amen. <laughs> You look at that video and you're like, how can you pack more things in a year? And I was just telling you already, we're going to show you how this year. <laughs> um, I, I ask you, I covet your prayers because um, it what started out with Kenya and the possibility of Thailand for mission trips looks like it's going to be Kenya, India, Thailand, and Pakistan again. And just need your prayer because uh, Shazad said that God put this city on his heart. It is the city that's known to be the strongest city of witchcraft in all of Asia. And he goes, when he started to pray with his prayer team last week, he said, God put you on my heart. And I was like, I bet he did. So um, just be praying. And, and part of it is um, who God has ordained to come with on each of these trips. Because the, the Kenya trip is full, we're, we're you know, working on that. But the other three, it's very strategic what, what we'll be doing for God in each one. And so I need intercessors. And um, in, in India, you know, we're going to be doing pastors training during the day, huge crusades at night. Obviously, in Pakistan, it's some serious warfare. But you know, Jesus said before he comes back, he's going to conquer every nation and every leader. So... And he told us in Matthew 28, go out in all the world, make disciples of every nation. So I'm kind of excited to be a part of that. And I think it's pretty special timing that's going on. Amen? Sermon today. Kingdom, the kingdom language is love. Now, we've been in the power of words. And last week, um, you know, last week was God. It was true. But, I mean, it was, it was pretty heavy. And I don't think this is a reaction. I think it's a reality. So if you turn your Bibles, take your PDA, turn with me to cha uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 5, and stand with me. Love is a language. And no, it's not the five love languages. Love itself is a language. In fact, without love, your language is not the language of heaven. So Romans 5, 5 says this, For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. God, I pray today that you would just break off any lies about you, about our identity, about the truth of the kingdom of God, and Lord, that you would just pour into our hearts who you are. God, <laughs> in a liquid form, which is love, and just fill us with the language of heaven, the language of the kingdom of God, the language of the family of God, the language of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. So how is love defined according to the Bible? In Romans 5, 6 through 11, it says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and he died for our sins. Now, most people would not be willing to die for the upright person, <laughs> Though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. 
And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of the son. For now we can rejoice in the wonderful new relationship with God we have because of the Lord Jesus Christ and he's made us friends with God. The love of God was so great that even though us, who he created in his image, in rebellion against him, in the midst of the height of our rebellion, he showed the ultimate act of love by sending his son to die for us. Not after we repented, not after we said we were sorry, in the midst of the height of our sinfulness. If you're a parent, that's almost inconceivable. Romans 5, 12 through 21, it says, Then Adam sinned, sin, when he did, the sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yeah, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet the law to break. Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even though those who did not disobey or explicit, any explicit command of God, as Adam did, everyone died because of the result of Adam's sin. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who is yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of one man, Adam brought death to many, but ever greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. You see, God's love is defined by his grace and his forgiveness. And it's a gift that cannot be earned. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation. You know, one of the first verses I memorized as a teenager, because there's things that happen when you're 13, 14, 15 years old. And I'm going to mention it because just in case you're a parent and it's coming up, you need to be reminded. There are three chemicals that start flowing in the brain that weren't flowing before then. So, you know, up until that point, your kids meh, semi listen to you. But then there's serotonin, melatonin, and the anaphrim, and they start flowing in your brain, and pretty soon your teenager turns into that person that knows more than you, and they think you're stupid. And good luck with that, because they start to reason on their own, and it's a scary time. All right? It just is. And you need to realize that there's a huge transition that took place, and your kids aren't just going to do, uh, they're not going to stay in the row, in the line, in the queue that you prepared for them and, and, and abide by the rules you told them because now they see life totally different. You know, if I could describe what life was like before those chemicals hit your brain and after, it'd be like when my son told me what a trip of acid was like. <laughs> He's like, Dad, you should try this before you preach someday. <laughs> no. No, I don't. No. And I said, no. He said, but you see everything and like, oh, it's like psychedelic color. Everything just comes to life. It's so much more vivid. And seriously, it's like when these chemicals, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, they, get adjust, they have to adjust to these chemicals secreting in their brain and they see life totally different. And you need to understand that happened or, you know, there's gonna, things are going to happen and you're going to go, what happened? Well, that's kind of what sin did with Adam. God had this beautiful plan, but in that plan, he had to be worshipped. And in order to be worshipped, there had to be a choice. But instead of just saying, hey, let's just wipe this all out and start over again. Before he even started his plan, he had a plan to save the lost, to save those who made that choice. You know, I saw an interesting little meme uh, last night. It was Four little pictures of Kermit the Frog. One is Kermit fishing by himself on a river. Another, he's leaning up like a tree by himself. All four of them, Kermit's by himself. And, and, and what it said underneath the caption was, is, this was what it must have been like for Abel when he was waiting for the next person to die. There's, it's like he's the only one there. You get it? You know? Nobody else is up there. He's all alone. <laughs> it's like... And I was like, huh, never thought of that. But the reason it hit me was 
That was really the first really horrific result of that first sin. It brought death to everyone. And, and that was so, so outside of the plans of God. I mean, come on. Brother gets jealous with his brother for the sacrifice he made before God. And so he, you know, stones him. And you're like, what just happened? But God had a plan even before that to send his son. And that's the gracious gift that demonstrates the love that he has for you, that he has for me, that he has for all of us. For the sin of one man, Adam, caused death to rule over man. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and the gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yeah, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everybody. Christ's one act of righteousness brings the right relationship with God and new life for everyone. And as I was saying <laughs> seven minutes and 32 seconds ago before somehow I jumped off on a rabbit trail, as a young man and all those chemicals started secreting in my brain, I started to be absolutely condemned by the enemy. I mean, every day he, he just could get in. Up until then, you know, I, I just, my parents were what I would say were oh, pre-moderns. It's like my church was pre-modern. That didn't mean we use horse and buggy, but it meant the way we thought was God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. I mean, that was our mentality. Now, moderns, you know, who kind of came in after baby boomers, the busters, they, they really ushered in this age of uh, questioning and reason, and they only believed that if there were statistics and, and facts to back it up. They wanted to see the research. And, and frankly, to me, they're the most gullible with the internet because they'll see a, you know, a fact sheet put out by somebody who really wants to promote their side of the story, and they'll go, well, look at here. The internet said it. It's got to be true. And you're like, come here. Let me hit you upside the head. Seriously. But th those are the moderns. And then the, the postmoderns, they have to see it acted out in a relationship. Well, I, I, I'm saying all this because before teenaging hit in for me, I was very much pre-modern. But then as soon as I could start rationalizing and thinking, it's like the enemy came in like a flood to attack my thoughts and condemn me every day. And every sin I did or thought, even, any, even if I had a sinful thought, even if it's a silly, stupid one, like, you know, I really don't like that guy and he's about ready to sit down in, this, you know, in, in the cafeteria and I think maybe I'll just pull the chair out. You know, I mean, just little thoughts like that would creep in. And I wouldn't do it, but Satan would go, you are a heathen. You should be ashamed of yourself. And I begin to memorize Romans 8, 1, for there's therefore not no condemnation, condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And I would say that in combat of the mind and of this battle that was going on. And I say that because God has this message for you today because Jesus' gracious gift of his life and his blood is to cancel the condemnation that you feel. So even when you do wrong, you did wrong. And you need to repent. But the feeling of condemnation is not from God because he loves you. God's love produces grace. The, the Greek word charisma, a divine um, gratuity. Wow. A divine gratuity. You know, the average gratuity now is at least 20%. Except God's was 100%. And it brought deliverance. You know, we were just at a Sosa conference, and that's the Greek word for salvation, and it means saved, healed, and delivered, or uh, rescued from the tyrant. But what was interesting is I was studying the words for salvation six months ago, and I, I'm like, well, what's the other one? Soteria. Well, what does that mean? Saved, healed, and delivered. <laughs> they both mean saved, healed, and delivered. There is no word for salvation in the New Testament that just means get a ticket to get out of heaven free or get out of hell free. They all mean, sorry, they all mean God, Jesus died. His gracious gift was to completely heal you. Okay? The cross was a complete act. Everything that, that you carry was nailed to the cross. Every pain, every shame, 
Every hurt that was done to you, every hurt you've done to somebody else, every disease, every sickness was nailed to the cross. Just a second. I want to see what Jesus has to say. <laughs> but either way, it's a complete act. God's love produces that gratuity. It's like he paid the price for your sin to deliver you, all right? It's a miraculous act that could not be done any other way. This is the love of God expressed through the gift of his son. Sin, on the other hand, parapatoma, is a side slip, it says. It's an error. It's a transgression in this case, in this verse. To fall, to have fault, offense, oh, offense, it's a horrible word. Sin, trespass. So sin came in through the act of Adam, but that gratuity, that pay the price, but 100% gratuity, paid the price for all of your sin came through Jesus. That is grace. Grace through one man bought, bought a bought for you is the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. God's love is incredible, infinite, and unfailing. First Corinthians I, if I could speak of tongues uh, of the earth and of angels, but did not love others, I would only be making a bunch of noise like a clanging cymbal. The point is, without love, it's not God. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possession, and plans, all knowledge on this earth, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but did not love others, it would be worthless, nothing. If I gave everything that I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body and I boasted about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. God's love is patient and kind. It does not, it's not jealous or boastful or proud. It's not rude. It does not demand its own way. Just stop there for a second. Put your own name in there. Let it sink in. Just put your own name in there. I am patient and kind. I'm not jealous or boastful or proud. I'm not rude. I don't demand my own way. It, I don't get easily irritated. By the way, the rest of you, would you please shut the ringer off on your phone? Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just trying to give you active living examples. All right. D does it fit? Does a shoe fit? Because that's the love of God. That's the love of God. It doesn't do that. It's not irritated. It doesn't keep any record of wrongs. No record of wrongs. Oh, well, I don't have them written down anywhere. <laughs> but is there a record? Yeah. What happens to the record of your wrongs with Jesus? says when you accept Jesus, what do you receive? You receive the love of God, and when you receive Jesus and the love of God, his blood washes over that list, erases it. It says it removes it as far as the east is from the west, and it casts it into the sea of forgetfulness. Now, here that, why that's so important, because that is a definition of the love of God for you. So if the enemy starts bringing up things from the past to make you feel condemned, He's lying to you. Your emotions are lying to you because those offenses, those sins, that list has been erased and thrown away. He doesn't keep a record of wrong. I got to tell you, most of my Christian life, I came to God sheepish, embarrassed, humiliated. In fact, many times avoided God. I'd come in here and say, God, I'm so sorry. I screwed up. You know? And it, it took a while for me to understand that God didn't see me that way. God was not telling me that I was horrible. God wasn't reminding me of my failures. The enemy was. Well, that doesn't mean you shouldn't feel sorry for what you do, but you shouldn't walk around in condemnation because God is there cheering for you. Even yesterday, you know, I'm feeling, I'm, I'm at this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm mature now. 
Okay, my age is an age of maturity. I just thought I'd have to clarify that. Sorry. Okay. I've been around a while. All right, I'll put it that way. But I'm, I'm at this Sozo conference yesterday, and we're going through these gifts, or these, you know, these, these uh, tools, and, uh, you, know, you know, the father ladder, how do you see father God? And, uh, and your relationship with male figures, you know, father figures could affect how you see. And then there's Holy Spirit, and that could be affected by your mom. And, and I'm sitting there, you know, going through it, and going, I'm, you know, I've got this, I've been sozo you know, I've been through seven prayer ministries. I've had a, and all of a sudden it just hit me, because one of the trainers said, you know, if your mother was ever like a perfectionist, and if your mother was ever kind of controlling, and had a tendency of just telling you what you did wrong instead of focusing on what you did right, you might not talk to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you might be a redneck. Anyway, and I was like, huh, I don't talk to the Holy Spirit very much. And then all of a sudden we get to the father, I go back to the father and I'm like, wait, my dad did the same thing. Love the guy, really do love them both. But it affected my relationship with the Godhead. And so then they're like, be quiet, just shh, sit before God and see what God says to you about this. You guys should try this sometime. That's right. Even now. But, so I did. And he goes, it's literally like I could feel it and put his arm around me, Father God. And he goes, I'm your biggest fan. Just let me coach you. If you let me just coach you, I'll coach you to greatness. It's like this cool moment, okay? <laughs> you know, it, it, it was worth my Saturday at a ministry. But see, that's what he wants to do with you every day because that's God's love. He's an encourager, not a discourager. The grace of God covers it all. He's cheering you on. He sees you for who you're meant to be, not for who you were. Satan wants to define you, keep continually redefining you by the sin that you did. And Jesus is trying to redefine you by who he's created you to be. You're a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. That's who you are. See, God loves, produces that grace. It flows through him to you continually. And he is so incredible that he has chosen to pour that into you through his Holy Spirit. When you fully experience God's love, you have nothing to fear. Such love is so, it has no fear. 1 John 4, 18, 5, and then uh, through 5, 5. But 1 John 4, 18, for such love had no fear because perfect love, what? Casts out all fear, throws it out, expels it. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. You know, somewhere in this Sosa conference yesterday, God just parked me on punishment. I mean, he was just doing surgery, man. I, you know what? I was a table leader. I was there to be a leader. <laughs> I shouldn't have any sin or problems. Let's laugh at that. But anyway, he just, he just brought a punishment to me in one of our breaks, and I was sitting there and going, oh, yeah, wow. You know that there's no punishment in God. Not in our relationship. Not when we accept Jesus. No. There is an eternal punishment for everyone that does not accept Jesus and it's hell and it's real. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But when you accept Jesus, not only does the condemnation goes, the punishment goes. Why? Because the punishment was nailed to that cross. Now that does not mean that he won't discipline you because he loves you enough to discipline you. But discipline and punishment are two totally different things. When you're a kid and you run in fear and you get beat and you can't quite figure out why, that's punishment. If you have consequences for your actions and you understand what your action was and you know that your action was wrong and the consequence probably is equal to what you needed, that's discipline and it's good. But punishment is not from God. Satan is an incredible punisher. Emotionally, relationally, so many other ways. But punishment is not from God. He loves you, right? Whew. So if you have that fear of punishment, it's a lie. Break it off in the name of Jesus and memorize this verse. Because such love has no fear, because perfect love casts all fear. And if you are afraid, it's because of a fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. I'm going to go take a love shower now and wash off this punishment. 
How do I do that? I throw, I throw worship up. I get into the word. I start praying. We love each other because he loved us first. And if somebody says, I love God, but they hate their brother and sister in Christ, that person's a liar. Whew. That's strong words. That's the truth of the word of God spoken in love to you. You can't be full of God's love and hate your brother and sister. You can't be full of God's love and want somebody to be punished, want retaliation. Retaliation and punishment, those are tools in the enemy's toolbox. You know, there was many years ago, I want to say, I don't even know now, 12, 14, 15 years ago, got the book The Culture of Honor. I was going through it with a staff member who happened to relapse into heroin and steal over $20,000 of the stuff from the church, and I put the book, The Culture of Honor, away for a while. <laughs> but when I picked it back up and I read it, one of the first things that jumped off the page was, you know, honor, the culture of God's honor is not about you being honored, it's about you honoring other people, regardless, regardless of how much they honor you. So, oh, the way I only want to honor. I'll be in the sanctuary praying for a while. Do you get it? Because you're a container of the grace, the love, the character, and the nature of God, you are to honor regardless of how you're honored. In fact, I don't even think angels get out of their seat and pick up their harp until you honor when you're not honored. Because it's really easy to honor when you're honored. Are you following me? Oh, but God is honored when you honor when you're not honored. That makes it your honor to honor. Do you get it, your honor? All right. Whew. Okay, I'm running on a, you know, a little less sleep than necessary. Four, if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God who we cannot see? For he has given us this command, those who love God must also love their Christian brothers and sisters. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. Let me tell you what, the two things the church needs to focus on is worship and unity. Those are really the two most important things that you need to guard and protect and be a part of. So when the enemy, when you, you, you get irritated, I don't, I mean, every once in a while I might just, you know, spend a lot of time with people in the church, some people more than others, and, you know, you, the more time you spend with somebody, the more little things can start irritating you. Would you wish you stop that? Would you, would you, would you, would you quit making that noise? Well, oh, my goodness. Oh, would you? Who gives you that? It's not Jesus. Offense, irritation, all of that stuff is from the wrong kingdom, and it's not an expression of God's love. Your job is to protect and defend each other. I, I love some of the sayings. Uh, the fact that, you know, like Pastor Kim has used this on me too many times. And <sighs> just pray that she could stop. <laughs> but that would mean that I would give her a reason to stop. But she'll say, anytime I get frustrated and I say anything negative about anybody that's a believer, she said, don't talk negative about the bride. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If they're a believer in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter how obnoxious they are. God loves them. That means you must love them. And you know what? Great shall all of your reward be for loving me. 30 years. I thank you very much. Whatever it is, you have to bring it to God and realize that he's using that irritation to chip away at your rocky uh, exterior to create you into the image of God, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with the other person. All right, what happens when sand gets inside an oyster? What does it create? A pearl? Thank God. You know, I thank, I'm just going to, God, I thank God for all the irritation that the body of Christ has caused me for 30 years, and I know inside me is a pearl of great price. I'm just going <laughs> to... No, that's the, the attitude you need to have. God's love is a shield surrounding you and keeping you safe. Psalms 5, 11 and 12 says this, but let all who take refuge in you, in God, rejoice. 
Let them sing joyful praises forever. Spread your protection over them, that all who love your name will be filled with joy. You know, I think one of the, one of the greatest things that come with age is that you just start to realize the things that used to really bother you really are so insignificant at the end of the day. You ever know? I mean, it's just like, you know, I just, so what? It's like, God still loves me. I, I've still got, you know, heaven to look forward to. It's all good. It's all good. You know, I, I remember my short, incredible time in Australia, you know, it's like, oh, no worries, mate. No worries, mate. And it was just, you know, I, I remember a couple of people that I needed to have things done for me and they, they, they you know, a mechanic, it's like, hey, could you take care of this? I, you know, I, oh, no worries, mate. Well, I'm sorry, but in Minnesota, that never gave me any peace. It's like, how about you give me a timetable? How about we have a signed contract that this is done in three days? But in Australia, it's like, oh, no worries, mate. I come back the next day and it's done. And what I discovered down there, at least my experience, is when they said no worries, it meant no worries. Just like, dude, you just, when did you get that done? Oh, I just said late last night, mate, I wanted to make sure it get done for you, you know? Don't get too many of these Minnesotans down here. Um, But it it, it meant it. And there was just a cool, neat sense of joy. You know the neat thing? If you walk and operate inside the love of God, you operate inside of the protection of the love of God. And the experience that you have inside the bubble of the protection of God's love is joy. It's joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It's so good. Do you realize that you're surrounded by a force field of God's infinite love? So if you don't think that you have love for somebody in a moment, you realize that it is around you. It's completely surrounded you. You just need to reach out for it. I was with, you know, a a, a couple yesterday, and and there was a moment (laughs) where the love began to lack. And I'm like, you know what you can do right now? You can actually just take a time out, just say, hey, I need that, and go take a walk, be alone with God, and recharge your love. So the guy got up to do that, and what was so cool is I came back, and they were both gone. Because he was recharging her love, she was recharging hers, and she was so moved by the love of God to go find him, and they came back looking like newlyweds. It's like, you're not alone in this. You're surrounded by a force field of the love of God. God will not let you down because his love cannot fail. Psalms 36. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. The unfailing reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the ocean deep. You care for people and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadows of your wings. You feed, you feed them from the abundance of of your house and your love, and they drink from the rivers of delight. Why? For you are the fountain of life, the light by which they see. Pour out your unfailing love on those who love you. Give justice to those who have honest hearts. You've undoubtedly been hurt or betrayed by somebody. Somebody you love. And the closest, the closer they are, the more vulnerable you are, and the harder it hurts. Many of you have actually been betrayed and hurt by loved ones more than once. And you could tell me your stories. So just take them to God. I'll, I'll, I'll pray with you. Just take them to God. We, once a person gets hurt, it becomes harder to open up to others. But with God's love, his love is truly unconditional. He never fall, fails us. He never betrays us. He never lets us down. He never ignores us. You do not need to hold back in your relationship with God because he is totally trustworthy. When you are hurt by others, read these verses and remind yourself. Though people may let me down, God never will. God's love never fails. God calls you his child. 1 John 3, 3 through 1. How, see how very much the Father loves you. For he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world, they don't even recognize that, uh, that we're God's children. Dear friends, we are already God's children. But he has not yet shown us 
what we'll be like when Christ appears. God chose to adopt us. Ephesians 1, 5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us um, to himself through Jesus Christ. You know, I'm adopted. And that's a good thing. Because I'm adopted by the king of the universe, the God of heaven, the Lord of righteousness, and the perfecter of my faith and the very definition of unconditional love. So we praise God for his glorious grace that he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. So he is, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom by the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan regarding Christ, a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure in and through us. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everyone together under the authority of Christ, everyone in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because of the, we are unified with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, and he has chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. I want you to say that with me. He makes everything work out according to his plan. Some of you right now, you're going, I don't know how I'm going to pay my taxes. I don't know how I'm going to fix my car. I don't know. And God's going, just say this together with me. He makes everything work out according to his plan. Whatever it is, just hold it up to him and say, he makes everything work out according to his plan. You see, God loves you so much that he sacrificed his son for you. God loves you so much you could never earn or deserve that love. Ephesians, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life through raising his son Jesus from the dead. For he raised us from dead along with Jesus and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us in future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of the grace and kindness toward us. I mean, you've ever thought of that? He's chosen you to be an example to future generations of his grace. I mean, you, you catch that? I mean, every time Satan tries to put you down and think, you, you know, to try to define you by your past, you're going, well, well, excuse me, but something might be a little off there because God chose me to be an example for future generations of his grace. Okay? That's why your testimony is so incredible because God is always using it even if you don't know. And he's using it to point to you people who don't know where to go, don't understand, don't have any hope. And he says, you see that person? I'm like, yeah, why are they so happy? And I remember them, I remember them back in the, what? and he goes, that's my grace. And he uses you to point future generations to his grace. That's his love. That, you're bathed in his love. You're washed in his mercy. You're full of his presence. So God can point to us, to future generations. God saved you by the grace when you believed. You can't take credit for it. It was a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things that you have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. Hmm. You know, this was in my positive life command statements I was supposed to say every morning and every night into the mirror out loud. And I tell you, I wrestled. That was many years ago. I mean, now I just look and go, oh, God, you did such a great job. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, I mean, you are God's masterpiece. He designed you. Okay? And when it first started, I used to watch those, you know, robots that they would make in college, and then they would fight each other, you know, in the ring and tear each other up. I would be so amazed that 19 and 20-year-olds could create such a masterpiece of destruction. Well, I was like, no, wait a minute. I had kids. I can understand that. But God created each one of us as a masterpiece. And if you don't feel like a masterpiece, go to the master, and he'll show you the piece that you are, okay? Where you fit into the puzzle and what it's for. God gives us the Holy Spirit because he wants us to be filled with his love, right? 
Romans 5, we started with that. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know God dearly loves us because he gives us his Holy Spirit to fill us with his love. Running out of time, but not scripture. Luke 11, for everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, everyone who knocks, the door will be open unto him. Your fathers, okay, if a child asks you for a fish, do you give him a snake? Better not. If you, <laughs> To ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. If your sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly Father know how to give you the Holy Spirit when you ask? God disciplines you to help you learn. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. I was dealing with this yesterday. If you... Somebody loves you and they're trying to give you corrective criticism, okay? And you put a wall, a defensive wall up, you're hurting yourself. How much more when it's God? And he does this. He nudges us. He, 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 it says that he'll use a goad. He'll kind of poke at our, our conviction and say, hey. But he does it out of love. Don't be upset when he corrects you, for the Lord corrects those he loves, just as the father corrects a child who he delights in. Stand with me. We need to make a transition. My whole point today, from all of these scriptures, all of these sayings, is that the language of God is love. Regardless of what you've been told about God, what you've been told about religion, what you've been told about the church, the language of God is love. But out of that love, he will show you. That's a great, great decision made. A person was giving this testimony the other day. They had, they had a friend that had um, gone into an alternative lifestyle, and he was, he, was, he was making decisions to go to the point of no return. Uh, and they so wanted, you know, as a Christian, they, and, and love God, and they love their friend, they so wanted to tell them, that they were wrong and tell them what they should be and Jesus wouldn't let them. Jesus just said this, tell them about me. Introduce them to me. Bring them into a relationship with Jesus. And then Jesus lovingly told them, And they are now walking in the identity that he designed them to be in. But too many times, here's where the big issue comes. If you understand the love of God, you listen to the love of God, you respect the love of God, and you walk in the love of God. If you walk in religion and you think of God as judgment, then what happens is you start playing God. And you start doing his job. Because you think he's, he's a judge. So you judge other people. You tell them what they're doing wrong. You're you're pointing them in the right direction. But just like 1 Corinthians 13, if there's no love on it, you're not speaking the language of your father. And it's amazing if you just speak the language of the father, the love of God, point them to Jesus. There's something that was told me. You see, what I love about the book of Mark, we've been going through it, is that we see how Jesus speaks the language of his audience, whoever they are. From the very beginning, he saw Andrew and Peter, James and John, and what did he say? I will make you fishers of men. Why? Because they were fishermen. Genius. (laughs) But what you know about fishing is that When it comes to Christianity, it's our job to catch the fish. And God cleans them. Pretty good deal. But if you don't get that image right of God, you think you have to try to clean them before you get them in a boat. You're never going to catch a fish that way. It's the love of God. It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Love is the language of the kingdom of God. And the last point, God loves you, deal with it. I mean, he just does. It took me years just to accept that. Seriously. Because I didn't, I didn't, you know what? I didn't deserve it. 
I don't deserve God's love. God's love unconditional, but I've sinned. <laughs> For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the wage of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life of Jesus Christ the Lord. If I would confess in my mouth and believe in my heart, the Lord Jesus is, is the Son of God and that he died on the cross and he rose again. And I, I believe in him and I ask him into my life. And <sighs> I don't even get to determine whether or not I'm worth it. He already did. He already did. He determined every one of your worth on the cross, people. You're worth the shed blood of the Son of Almighty God. No higher value. And you know what? Your value doesn't go up and down with the stock market. It's always the highest price, the highest value, the shed blood of Jesus, because that's God's love for you. There were three words of knowledge in the prayer room. First one is if you're feeling hopeless, if you'll come for prayer, um, God wants to trade that in. Um, he's going to take that worthless Bitcoin and he's going he's to exchange it for hope. Second of all, some dealing with fear, fear of their financial needs. God has a, an abundance waiting for you. Step up in faith for him. The third one is somebody needs healing in their hands. So prayer ministers, if you'd come, just come over here to this side um, between here and the door over there prayer ministers because whoever needs prayer will be going into that door and you will not come out the same that's okay you don't want to because that room over there is waiting it's full of God's love for you I'm going to pray in just a second if you have children and they're upstairs we're so glad and happy you have children but Please go get them. The rest of you, the annual business meeting will be starting in just a few minutes. I ask you to go out back doors, fill out the roster. There'll be two lists, one for those who are members and one who are not members. If you are not a member, but you're interested in um, the business of the church, it's brief. We'll make it as quick as possible, but um, you're welcome to come. But I, let me just pray a blessing on you. God, I just pray that you would break through any barriers between your children in this congregation, those watching on TV, and your love, your perfect love that casts out all fear, all shame. For there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. You guys acted before I even prayed. If you're not staying for the meeting, bless you and have a great day.